guys, uh, good morning and welcome to this uh, lecture. So if you can see uh, the title of my presentation is Resist the Resistance. So I think you have all heard about what an antibiotic resistance is, right? So we have now bacteria that are not being killed by the drug that we use. So in the near future, in the near bleak future, you might have uh, incurable diseases. You might die of common cold. But not to scare you, we are working on it, we are working and we can find a solution soon. And how we are doing it, that's what we're going to talk about in our lab. We work to find new molecules that can cure bacteria, that can kill bacteria that are like uh, worthwhile, they are like, uh, resistant to, disease, uh, to drugs that we use today. So let me dive on to my lecture and that's me. I look a bit different because of November and... Uh, I think this was in a Halloween party last uh, year. I was going as Daredevil, and uh, the girl behind me, she was uh, Hulk, Bruce Banner, but she's a bit skinny for that. So uh, I did my master's and bachelor's in uh, India. I, I'm actually a pharmacist. I'm a pharmacist by training, so I studied pharmacology. I know about drugs. I know how to uh, combat diseases. But I forgot most of it right now because it's been years since I've learned them, and. So I worked, uh, while I was in masters, I worked with nanoparticles for cancer drugs. So you know that we have so many drugs for cancer these days, but still cancer is a big problem everywhere. Why? Because the drugs that we use never reach the cells properly. So I worked in a project that will make nanoparticles, like really, really tiny particles, uh, 10 to our 9 meter across, which would have the drugs and they would reach the, all the crevices inside the cells and they would kill the cells. So I did that for two years and I moved here to Baylor for doing PhD in the biology department. So I completely shifted my uh, project and I'm working in antimicrobial uh, drugs. So again, I'm in drugs, like in drugs, drugs, not the other drugs. So uh, by my shirt, you can say I'm a nerd because everyone in the biology department is kind of a nerd. So it's a graduate school. That's where we end up. The nerds end up in graduate school. So how we began, like... Have you seen any, I mean, you have seen some older films where they fight in medieval times and they die of, they do this, so do they see, uh, do they show what happens to the warriors if they survive the wound? Do they ever show that? Like if you get injured in a battlefield, they never show after that, right? Yes. They will have a slow, painful death because bacterial infection. So a uh, hero might uh, return with, uh, with a big gashing wound but he will die soon after because he will have uh, septicemia because there were no drugs back then. And there was nothing, there was no idea that bacteria could cause uh, diseases back then. Uh, this guy, uh, he's a Hungarian guy who was working in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the General Hospital of Vienna, Ignaz Semmelweis. He's a very important guy. What happened was Ignaz Semmelweis was working in a hospital where they had a maternity ward and they had two different maternity ward. One with, was delivered by doctors and one which was uh, handled by uh, midwives. You know what midwives are, right? So, I mean, these days you won't see midwives anymore. But back then it was an important uh, job to be a midwife. And they had this weird uh, phenomenon that all the patients, all the, uh, all the mothers that were giving birth in the maternity ward handled by trained doctors were dying in fever soon after childbirth. And the midwife section, they were still healthy. Why? The doctors had way more training than the midwives ever did. So he figured out, you know what, let's improve the, sani the sanitation of the doctors a little bit. So he, so he brought in uh, a disinfectant, chlorinated lime. So like, it's like a weak bleach back those days. And he would ask the doctors to wash their hands after every surgery because they were doing surgery as well. So the doctors were doing surgery like they had to treat wounded soldiers and everything else and they would go back treating the, uh, the birthing mothers. So he asked them to wash their hands in a weak solution of bleach and then what happened was in one month the mortality of mothers dropped to 20% and the second month it dropped to 1%. It was even better than the midwife section. Why, was, why were they dying off? Any idea, anyone? Why would, huh? No bacteria. Yeah, there was a bacteria because the doctors would treat a wounded soldier. They had bacteria on the wounds. They would go back to uh, give birth to a child. They would transfer the bacteria. So the mothers would die of a, 
a fever, bacterial fever. And if when they wash the hands in between the surgeries, they reduced the uh, chance of infection and so they did better. And guess what happened to the guy? Oh, oh, I know what happened. What? Did, did they jail him? He, he got sent to jail? Yep. He gets sent to an asylum because the doctors thought it was an uh, indignity in their part of washing their hands because they thought, why would we wash hand after surgery? It was so uh, below our dignity. So he was treated as a madman and like he was sent to an asylum where he was beaten up and he died at the age of 47. So he was the guy who actually did the first ever controlled experiment about sterility, about infection, and he got treated as uh, insane. Uh, no wonder he's grumpy, right? In the picture, yeah. I mean, back then, all the pictures were grumpy. So when uh, Louis Pasteur, you know, I mean, he's a famous guy. Everyone knows him. Louis Pasteur and then Joseph Lister. These two guys, they had a, they first formulated the germ theory of infection. And then we went back and re-evaluated uh, Semmelweis' work. And we thought, oh, he was a genius. He was a real good, Semmelweis was a real good guy. He actually brought forward this idea of sterility. and Louis Pasteur and Lister later worked on that and we now know that bacteria cause diseases and there are ways to stop bacteria by using disinfectants and other uh, drugs. But even then, back then, they didn't have any oral uh, drug delivery for bacterial infection. So if you had an internal infection, you would die. You can wash the wounds with a, a phenol or like any other uh, disinfectant, <coughs> but we cannot ever uh, drink bleach, right? If we could drink bleach, it would solve everything. But we can't drink bleach. Yeah, it would solve everything. So suppose, I mean, if, if humans evolve in the future that they could drink bleach, then you would know no antibiotics ever because we would just clean the bacteria off. OK, so uh, how did the drugs for bacterial infection came into being? So this guy, Paul Ehrlich, he was a German guy. He was working in a dye factory. He was making nitrogenous dye, the Aza dyes. And he saw that the workers had a very low rate of infection. Again, scientist, still a scientist, so he figured out why would they have low infection. They would work in a dye factory, what was special about them. So he figured out maybe the dye had something special about that. So he thought, why not just look at the chemical structure? He found that they had this uh, sulfur, uh, the sulfated group, and he uh, started a new group of uh, drugs called the sulfonamides. We don't use them anymore because they, uh, we have use them so much in the past that the bacteria are getting resistant to them, so we don't use sulfonamides anymore. But like he was the first person who first thought of uh, an oral drug that can kill bacterial infection. And then came this guy. Everyone knows him, right? Yeah. Alexander Fleming. He discovered penicillin. Penicillin was the first proper antibiotic ever. And it was uh, uh, the lone antibiotic for a long, long time. And it was during uh, the Second World War when uh, penicillin was uh, used uh, so widely, but there was so uh, less supply of penicillin. There was a story like uh, they were in camps, they had not enough penicillin for treating everyone. Do you know what they did? Any idea? Like, think of the most far fetched, gross idea you have. How would they use penicillin? Take it out of dead bodies. Mm, close. We, when we, when we uh, consume drugs, about 70% of them we just excrete out in our urine. Oh. <laughs> so they took, <laughs> collected the urine from soldiers, we treated with penicillin, and they would filter it to get penicillin out and use it again. Mm. Yep. <laughs> but it, I mean, uh, kind of worked. I mean, uh, well, penicillin saved uh, countless lives in, during World War II because there were so many wounds, so many infection all over. They fight in the the tropical region, in uh, Japan, uh, in uh, all the Pacific Islands. So you had to have something that's uh, readily available and easy to kill. I and mean, that was the only drug back then. There was nothing else. So uh, and do you know how he discovered penicillin? Through accident. Through accident. And he had this uh, Staph aureus uh, plate. And then suddenly it grew uh, mold, penicillium uh, notatum, which is actually bread mold. And the bread mold got there from his lunch bread. We wouldn't even think of having our lunch bread near Staph aureus plate ever these days. So they had no idea what sterility was back then. But thank God we have now. I mean, also thank God they didn't have any idea of sterility back then. Then it wouldn't have been discovered. 
So penicillin was the first drug that was that came out from uh, that would kill a, a, a bacteria. So they were called antibiotic because they were from biotic sources, but would kill bacteria, kill other biological organisms. So antibiotic. But then what happened? So this is a small uh, overview of the common drugs that we have. You see the year of discovery, 32. And the observance of first resistance was 10 years after that. So the drug came out in 32. In 10 years, they found strains that were already resistant to that. Now go down, uh, say here, rifampicin. Have you heard of rifampicin? It's a common drug we use in uh, leprosy and uh, tuberculosis. Not anymore because it was discovered in 1957 and see, five years. It took five years for them to find a resistant <coughs> strain. So as we go down the, uh, the line, the faster the resistant strain, uh, the strain came to being. Now, if you think about that, that well, is that like after it was completely useless? No. Uh, the resistant strains are very rare strains, which never t becomes the major population because they are pretty, pretty rare. And bacteria has a very small genome compared to us. So we, how big is the genome? Uh, size inside this three billion base pairs bacteria has around in thousands so they can't spare enough genes for to make them resistant because bacterial uh, antibiotic resistance isn't a very good gene for survival because they don't they don't give them food they don't uh, give them protection they just happen to protect them from a chance that they will be acted upon by antibiotics which is a very slim chance for natural uh, cells so those resistant genes are very uh, costly for them to maintain. So that's why uh, resistant strains are very, very rare. They're never the part of like normal bacterial population. But as we continue to use antibiotic, what happens? All the normal ones die off. What are the ones left? The resistant ones, and they will grow in their space. And so over the years, a bacteria that was supposed to be non-resistant will become resistant. So this is again a timeline you see uh, we have in 1940s, we have penicillin. Uh, penicillinase is an enzyme that breaks penicillin. It was first discovered in 1940 and like in 2000, we have fluoroquinol, which is a pretty, pretty uh, important drug that we use for urinary tract uh, infection. Even that was found uh, deemed to be unuseful because resistance grew against them. So it's kind of like this, we have this antibiotic which will kill a superbug. But as it kills the superbug, a newer mega superbug comes in. We are always at a uh, disadvantage in this position. We have nowhere to go, nothing to do. So what happens in the, when we use antibiotics? So they can work in two ways. They can either be statics, bacteriostatics, which means it will stop the growth of bacteria. And there's bactericidal, which will kill the bacteria completely. Both these drugs are equally effective and ineffective in uh, fighting infection. Because for statics, uh, bacteria will uh, not die off. They will just stop growing. But if they're resistant to it, they will bounce back. For sidal, it will just kill them all. But even if there is two bacteria, say like from a billion, maybe like two colonies left, they can bounce back on again. So like uh, you've, ha you've seen these ads, right? They kill 99.99% of germs, 99.9% .9 of germs. What happens to the rest? What happens to the 0.1% that <coughs> gets away? They come back as a deadlier bacteria. So how does the antibiotic work? So there are several mechanisms and we can be classified. So first, the most important thing, so they can inhibit the cell wall synthesis and cell wall is pretty important. You see this cell wall is preventing that ball entering the cell. So it's pretty important, right? So penicillin, ampicillin, all the cellins that you he hear of, all the cellin, amoxicillin, they're all, uh, they all inhibit the synthesis of cell wall. They just disrupt the cell wall and the bacteria dies off. They could also inhibit protein synthesis. All the mycins, streptomycin, canamycin, vancomycin, they just destroy their protein synthesis capability. So the back, protein is life, right? Protein is life. We don't have protein, then cell won't work. So if you just destroy a cell's mechanism of uh, making proteins from scratch, you just effectively kill the cell. And then also there's a bacterial membrane function. So the membrane, the, bacter the bacteria has no mouth, no uh, oral uh, vacuoles even for single cells. So they 
the only way of them ingesting food is through assimilation, absorption through the cell membrane. If you inhibit their function, you kill the bacteria. Or you can uh, <coughs> inhibit uh, metabolites. So where do we get our vitamins from? Our vitamins we eat, we get them from our food. The bacteria needs them as well, but do they have a wide source of food that we use? No. So they have very inherent uh, synthetic pathways inside them that would create new vitamins like folic acid or niacin or something like that, which helps them to survive. And if we disrupt that, all the sulfur drugs the disrupt the, foli the folic acid synthesis, uh, the bacteria dies off. And there's also uh, some other bacteria that can just stop the function of proteins, for the function of uh, uh, DNA polymerase, like uh, ciprofloxacin. They will just stop. They will, ciprofloxacin is a drug that will, uh, that works in a very unique way. So you know what in what st uh, in what state is the DNA present in our cells? Is it like a single string? It's double stranded in a super coil. So the coiling is done by uh, an enzyme called the topoisomerase in us. For bacteria, it is gyrase. And ciprofloxacin, all the floxacins that you hear of, they would disrupt the gyrase, so the bacteria would have a naked DNA, and they would the DNA, which is not coiled up, is uh, vulnerable to uh, damages, and the bacteria gets killed off. So these are the ways we can, the antibiotics work. So you think that there are so many ways, so why do they fail? Then these are very pretty fundamental ways of bacterial life, so why do they fail? So how do the, the bacteria tackle the drugs? So there can be mainly four ways. They can just simply block the drug to enter the cell. They can make ways, they can make thicker cell walls or different cell walls. They will just block the, bacteria, the antibiotic to enter the cell in the first place. Uh, they can use inactivating enzymes. So th the bacteria would produce enzymes that will just break the chemical structure of the drugs. And so the drugs are rendered inactive. And they could just have an efflux. So they have tiny pumps in them which would just take the drug in, pump it out, take it in, pump it out. So they, the drug won't build up inside the cell, so there is no way of killing the cell. And lastly, they would just alter the target molecule. So suppose you know how uh, a drug reacts with the cell or with any uh, living process. They would have a molecule, they would just go and latch onto the molecule, and this latching on involves the shape of the molecule. If you change the shape of the molecule, our drug won't act. So the bacteria may find ways of changing the target molecule so that uh, the drug won't go and bind with it. So who's responsible for it? Evolution. Evolution is the culprit behind everything. Why? Because of natural selection and the presence of hopeful monsters. So I mean, you have heard of mutations that happen in our body, right? Background mutations, they happen all the time. But are we mutants? No, we don't have powers. We just normal pathetic human beings. So uh, these mutations happen all the time, and that is because very few mutations are helpful. Do you know what the last, huge, last really helpful mutation that we had, like major evolutionary advantage? Any idea? Lactosization, yeah. So we couldn't even, we couldn't even uh, digest lactose for like uh, around 15,000 years ago. That's the thing we gained, lactose tolerance. So like, so you can say that people who are lactose intolerant, they are normal beings and we are the mutants who can digest milk. So yeah, that's the coolest thing we have, digesting milk. <laughs> so lactose tolerance was the last evolutionary uh, advantage that we had, but see, still it was like 15,000 years ago. And why is it so slow for us? Because we live for like, what, 70 years. Our generation is around like a hundred years gap for a generation. What is the size of a gen what is the length of a generation for bacteria? Huh? Yeah, 20 minutes they'll just double up. And so think of, in a year they would go through like hundreds of generation, thousands of generation, which will take millions of years for us. So think of the evolutionary advantage they have on us. So most of the mu uh, mutations that happen are just neutral. They don't have no, no effect on us. Very few are helpful and very few are harmful. So these are monsters, the mutated monsters, they just remain in the background. They have no uh, real effect on their population. They don't change the population makeup. So they don't even, uh, they don't, you don't even know that they are mutated monsters. 
and also the lifestyle is pretty costly because again I told you bacteria has a limited size of genome they cannot have uh, worthless I mean for them genes that will actually help for fighting antibiotic when they could use the genome space to get more proteins for making food or getting yeah, better food so being an antibiotic resistant mutant for a bacteria is a pretty costly lifestyle and so they're pretty rare and so like uh, to help you understand what how evolution works in that manner why isn't this okay okay so you know these guys right the mutant the mutant monsters in our uh, comics the pros they have super they have superhuman strength they have indestructible body gamma radiation can't kill them but what are the cons they have a huge body to maintain they have to eat more they have a costly lifestyle and they can do much else. I mean, they can ride a train, they can ride a car, even they can even ride something because they have huge stubby fingers. They can use a smartphone. Think of that. So it sucks to be them. So uh, in a normal population, the mutants are pretty rare. Everyone else is, I mean, they have a norm, uh, normal uh, genomic distribution. The mutants are pretty rare in this case. But what happens is the cataclysm. If there's a, an extinction level uh, event, what happens then? Who would survive? Their repopulation bottleneck, the mutants will survive, right? Because they have a huge body, they're indestructible. They are the ones who are surviving. Even though they were rare and they had a costly lifestyle, if there's a cataclysm event, that's a leveling field. We make it, uh, we make a conducive environment for them to survive and not for us. And this is called, in evolution, a population bottleneck. Do you know that, um, you know Finland, right? Do you know how the genetic variability in Finland is very, very low? Because only 30 families from mainland Europe went to Finland and all of the Finland's population are descended from those just 30 families. So this is an example of population bottleneck that happens if there's a cataclysm like this. So what happens when they are left behind? So the mutants now, they survive better in this uh, post-apocalyptic world and they would multiply and not the normal human beings. So now what the population is? Before this, the population had rare mutants and most of them are normal and now after the cataclysm after the population bottleneck you have a population of entirely different makeup with mutants outnumbering the normal people now this is this doesn't happen in a single generation it happens in successive generation but this is what happens in bacteria and what is the cataclysm that we are uh, suppressing them to what kind of cataclysm is happening to them antibiotics because are, we are killing everyone it's like an atom bomb dropped on them we are killing everyone but we're letting the resistant few mutants surviving. And so now they will grow and now they will become the main population. So how scary it is in real life? Like, what happens, do you think? How fast can it happen? So this is a video they made in Harvard Medical School. And uh, so what they had was this, uh, they had this huge Petri dish, uh, two feet by uh, 10 feet Petri dish. Has anyone seen this video before? So uh, they had this petri dish and they had uh, divided the petri dish into uh, sections. The outmost section had no antibiotic at all. The inner section had just a barely minimum to kill the bacteria. The next section had 10 times the amount, then 100 and then 1,000 times the amount that requires to kill the bacteria. And they had a thin uh, agar layer to make the bacteria move around. And so the culture of the bacteria in the outermost plates, and you will see what happens. You see the white, uh, the white uh, light signifies the growth of bacteria. So they grew the entire region that had no antibiotic to it. And this suddenly you see, that's the mutant. That mutant survived the antibiotic and now it's growing. It grew and it will just fill up this entire slab that had the minimum, bare minimum amount of antibiotic required to kill the bacteria and now they've entered the 10 times zone now they're even surviving the 10 times the amount of antibiotic required to kill a bacteria 
and look, they have reached 100 times zone. Now, so that bacteria can survive 100 times the amount of uh, antibiotic required to kill the bacteria. And now these bacteria can survive 1,000 times. Think of 1,000 times. So like, think of one pill and 1,000 pills. They can survive that much of bacteria. Guess how many days it took? 11 days. It took 11 days for a complete normal strain of bacteria, an E. coli strain, traveling from a region of zero, zero antibiotic to reach a region of 1,000 times that required in 11 days. And of course, this is, a, this is a extrapolation of what happens in real life. We don't use that much of antibiotic all the time, so we are not screening the bacteria that much, but this is a possibility. 11 days. Even if it was 11 years, it was scary, right? Even if it was 11 years, it would have been equally scary. So, so uh, what kind of resistance we, fee, uh, we face uh, these days? So penicillin family, that's the penicillin family. And uh, uh, how many of you are very well aware in chemistry? Chemistry, anyone? A little bit, OK. So this is the ring. This is the ring structure that helps them to uh, the antibody, the penicillin to act actually. And so the bacteria have uh, found a way of making a penicillinase enzyme which just destroys the ring. So the bacteria destroys the penicillin from acting. Also, uh, how many of you have heard of Staph aureus? You have all heard of Staph aureus. Staph, staph infection is pretty common, yeah. Vancomycin is regarded as the gold standard for antibiotics because it's because it can kill everything. So if nothing kills a, kills a bacteria, vancomycin can. But even Staph aureus have found a way to block the entry of vancomycin inside them. And uh, you have all heard of MRSA, methicillin resistant uh, Staph aureus. So what they do is, I told you, methicillin, all the cillins are cell wall inhibiting agents. So they will go and uh, latch on to a specific site in the cell wall and destroy the cell wall. So, methicillin, so what the MRSA did, MRSA just changed the shape of the cell wall and they won't just go and bind. So we can give as much as drug as we want. The drug won't even go find its way inside the cell because the cell, the target molecule is altered. And then we also have the, uh, we call it ATP binding cassettes or ABC. These cassettes are tiny pumps, I told you. They would just take the drug in, pump it out. So no drug inside the cell. So yeah, these are the, these are the common resistance we, fee, uh, we face these days. And the population of bacteria having the resistance are growing steadily. So what happens is you have, say, a field of bacteria having this one or two resistance. As I told you, you kill all the good ones. The bad ones remain. They are the ones multiplying. And it doesn't stop there. The bad ones can transfer their gene to the good ones in a process called the horizontal gene transfer. You all know that? So you know what plasmid is, right? So bacteria has the genomic DNA and the plasmid DNA. So bacteria, so the usually the resistance that we see here, that we see uh, in uh, normal life, they are present in the plasmid. And so the bacteria would just spit out the plasmid. It will just stay in uh, the solution. And another bacteria coming by would just take it up. And so now it effectively has the resistance that the other bacteria had. So this is called horizontal gene transfer. Do we do any gene transfer in our body? Do we? Do the mammals do any gene transfer? We do. It's called a vertical gene transfer through the offspring. We give our offspring our gene. Horizontal is when we give our, in our same generation. But we can't pluck our gene out and give it to my friend, right? But the bacteria can do that. So if there is a resistant bacteria nearby, there's a big chance that the non-resistant bacteria might get that resistance by just taking the gene from the resistant bacteria. So again, not just evolution. Evolution is bad already. I mean, bad for us in the antibiotic case, not for generally bad. But evolution is uh, helping them getting a resistance, also horizontal gene transfer, and also viral transduction. So yeah. We try to kill bacteria, they become more mutant, they become more powerful, and they will just laugh and take over us in the near future. So our naturally existing bacteria that are resistant are pretty rare, and they're not even virulent. They don't even want to, they don't even want to attack us. 
they are, uh, I told you, pretty rare, so they present a very tiny proportion of the entire population. And, but when we use excess antibiotics, not only when we consume antibiotics, when we just dump them in the water system, there's bacteria in the water system, right? So they get exposed to antibiotic. When we feed our livestock antibiotic and we eat them, we get the antibiotic. The livestock gets antibiotic as well. Their feces gets uh, mixed up with the soil in the water. And again, more antibiotic in the system, more resistance it will uh, create. And so when uh, we kill all, all the good bacteria off, the benign bacteria off, the resistant bacteria has the open field, they will just grow and take their place. So this is how a benign population can become pathogenic in a span of years. So they weren't even pathogenic to begin with, they become pathogenic. And so how many of you have been to the hospital uh, recently just for like visiting, not like being admitted? How many? Have you felt sick after that? You're lucky. But there's a, there are many diseases that can be transmitted by hospitals. Why? Because we have so many antibiotics in the hospital everywhere. Because hospitals is the place where and it gets exposed to antibiotic every day of all kinds. There's antibiotic in the, the sewage, there's antibiotic in the water system, there's antibiotic in the uh, air system. So all the bacteria population living in the back in hospital, they get exposed to antibiotic all the time and they have a higher tendency to become resistant. And these diseases that ca that can happen to you when you visit a hospital are called the nosocomial diseases. And these were actually pretty benign species, uh, very pretty benign species to begin with and they become pathogenic because we have exposed them to antibiotic for so many years, 24 seven. So what should we do? We should discover new drugs, right? Discover new drugs that hasn't been had any resistance against. But the th situation is dire because if you see, this is a chart that shows you the development of antibiotic over the time. In the 80s, we had like 16 antibiotics that came out. In the 2000s, less than two. On the other hand, the resistance chart is growing up as we go near the 2010s. You see the resistance is growing up. So we are making lesser antibiotics and we are discovering more resistant strains day by day. We should also use uh, antibiotic judiciously, not use antibiotic all the time. We should make, and if we do it, be sure to complete the course because if you don't, then I mean, some might, they might survive and then come back as, as a resistant species. So what should we especially do? So we should think of uh, it like we should target our antibiotic towards the species that we want to kill and spare the other species. As I told you, a benign species, if it gets exposed to antibiotic all the time, will someday become pathogenic. So what if we had antibiotics that only kills the species that we want? Like we want to kill Staph aureus, but we don't want to kill, uh, say, B. subtilis. That is also a common bacteria in our gut. We don't want to kill them. But if we expose our gut bacteria to uh, antibiotic all the time, they might become pathogenic to us and then cause diseases. So we have to have antibiotics that kill the bacteria we want to kill and not spare others. But does it happen? When we have, so how many of you have had antibiotic in the recent past? Did you have a stomach cramp after that? Really? No stomach cramp? Anyone? Stomach cramp? Yeah, do you know why? Do you know why? In the gut gets killed off, yeah, and they do half the job of digestion. And so if you can't do digestion, because they're getting killed off by the antibiotic, we get stomach cramps. And so uh, also, yeah, uh, using targeted elimination will preserve our natural microflora. I mean, microbiome is a, so we all know of our genome, but how well are we aware of our microbiome? How much of you are you? Huh? No, more than that. <laughs> you more than thin. Like, how much of you, tell me how much of you are you? Like, how much of you are just you, human cells? 40%. 70%. So we have 30% cells in our body are actually, 30% uh, of mass in our body is actually bacterial colonies. So, uh, and if we, uh, if we, uh, if we uh, sequence our genome, we would get so many uh, microbial genome as well because they're everywhere in our body. And we have 
so many of our functions in the body are not only done by the back by our enzyme system they're done by the bacteria that we have we culture in our stomach like digestion most of the digestion is done by the microbiome also us but they are helpful as well and so we should opt for more personalized antibiotics that would only kill uh, specific antibiotics and uh, specific antibiotics that will kill the infection that uh, we uh, want to kill and spread the others so what do i do so i've been talking about uh, antibiotics and resistance so what do i do to help them so i make something called the antimicrobial peptides you know what peptides are small chains of proteins and these antimicrobials and they are found in nature i synthesize them in our bacterial system and i use them against bacteria to see how well they can fight up infections. Uh, the AMPs are a part of our natural immune system. So uh, if you see here uh, the defensin, this is an important uh, uh, peptide that helps in staving off bacterial infection and fungal infection in human beings. And they are found almost in all org organisms and they can have a huge spectrum of activity against bacteria, fungi, virus, and even some of them say they might kill cancer cells but we haven't done much of research on that and they have a huge variety of uh, structures so it, when we use antibiotics the conventional ones they are small chemical compounds so bacteria can get used to that they're pretty easy to destroy but we if we have big peptide complex structures they're harder to uh, fight by the bacteria and they have a completely different uh, mechanism of action for uh, bacteria and us, the eukaryotic cells, so we have no harm from them. And also they are hard to develop resistance, uh, uh, resistance against because they, ha they act so quickly, so there is a very small chance of exposure of bacteria to them, so there is very hard to get uh, resistance. So uh, they mainly act. They mainly act by disrupting cell membrane, but I, could, uh, I would like to confess that we don't actually know their exact mechanism of action. So we have seen uh, uh, AMPs everywhere, like all organisms that you can mention has their innate immune system built up of AMPs, but we have no idea how they really uh, act in the cells. We have, we have thought that we can, uh, the closest thing that we can come to is that they can disrupt the uh, membrane like a detergent. So how many of you have uh, seen a uh, oil sheen before? like in the sink, there's a sheen of oil on the saucepan or something. What happens if we just drop a drop of liquid soap on it? The oil disperses, right? So the lipid is the main backbone of the cell wall in bacteria or in all other cells. So if we have something that has a particular charge distribution and act as a detergent, they just go and disperse of the lipid and the bacterial cell wall gets disrupted and they will die. So that's the main uh, simplified action behind them so i worked with uh, so this is a so i work with two uh, uh, two uh, amps called plectocin and urosin and these are antibacterial uh, antibacterial amps and they fall in this family which are called cs alpha beta uh, uh, defensins you don't have to know that you don't have to know that Plectocin. So this is uh, being uh, developed from a fungus called the Pseudoplectania nigrella. It's a fungus. It's a fungal defensin. And the urosin has been uh, isolated from a fung same fung uh, fungus called the Eurotium amstelodami. You know what? I worked with them for two years. I never knew what where they came from before I made this presentation. Because we just knew they were there. We just worked with them and we didn't even care where they came from. So for this presentation, I learned new stuff. Yeah. So I'm learning as well with you. So there are small, they're like 40 amino acids long, they're not huge proteins, they're 40 amino acids and they have very, again loosely defined MOA mechanism for action because we don't know how they act. They may target and bind with a molecule called lipid 2. Lipid 2 is the main backbone behind the cell wall of the bacteria. So lipid 2 is required for cell wall formation, so if you just bind to that, they'll disrupt the cell wall formation and we can kill the bacteria. And they are especially effective against gram-positive bacteria like Staph aureus and not gram-negative because anyone? <coughs> what are gram-positive bacteria, negative bacteria? You have, have you had microbiology before? So 
that we could that we new thing you learned today so gram positive bacteria was are a special kind of bacteria that have a unique makeup of cell wall and gram negative bacteria have a different makeup of cell wall so these so there was a guy called Christian Graham, he was a Danish scientist and he figured out we can make a dye that will color a particular kind of bacteria and not color the rest. So the ones that got the color for his dye were called Graham positive, so like they were positive for, their, for his Graham dye and the ones that couldn't get the color were called the Graham negative. So this is how we divide the entire bacteria into Graham positive. So if you talk with any microbiologist, they would first thing that they would mention is it's a Graham positive or a Graham negative bacteria. So gram positive bacteria like Staph aureus or uh, strep Streptococcus pneumoniae, they are, they have a cell wall made up of something called peptidoglycan, and gram negative bacteria have something called lipopolysaccharide. So their cell wall is completely different. So the plectrocin and mecha the, the mechanism will only work with gram positive bacteria and not the gram negative ones. Yeah, okay, so we, what we do is we create plasmids that contain our desired AMP. AMP is short for antimicrobial peptides. Uh, we clone the plasmid into uh, E. coli cells and make the cells produce the, the peptide for us. So, some essential details. So, this is a bacterium with a genomic a DNA and a plasmid inside, right? So, what we do is we just take the plasmid out and we engineer the plasmid. We digest the plasmid using something called the expression digest. Have you heard, uh, have you heard about cloning before? Like what cloning is? So have you gone through these steps? So, so there's a, uh, there's a system called, uh, so uh, bacteria have a enzyme, an, an array of enzyme called the restriction enzymes. They would go and find very specific sequence on the DNA and cut them. So we use those enzymes to cut the plasmid and make an open ring. Okay, and then we get go to our DNA of interest and we cut them with the same restriction enzymes. So they have identical sequences. And you know Watson Crick base pairing like ATGC. So these, so these are complementary to these. So what happens if we just mix them together? They will just go and bind up. And so now we have a plasmid with our gene inside the plasmid. So now we have a plasmid that has our gene of interest inside the plasmid and the gene will encode our AMP. So this is what my plasmid, look, the plasmid that I look, work with this is what it looks like. So it has, a, so we make the plasmid and we just then put the plasmid back into our E. coli cells, and now our E. coli cell has the gene that we want it to have, and we can make it to work for us and make our own protein. So it's funny, we produce bacteria killing agents from bacteria. So we are making them produce them. So like it's so uh, embarrassing for them, right? So these are transformed bacteria, we'll have our AMP gene. So what, so, this is a plasma, what does it look like? So, so you all know the central dogma of biology, DNA to RNA, which translates to protein. So if we have our gene, the DNA, the bacteria will do the rest of the work and make our protein for us. So if we can just, we can, if you could just put our gene inside the bacteria, the bacteria will do the rest for us and they will transcribe it into RNA and then translate that RNA into proteins. So this uh, is our gene of our AMP here in the plasmid and this is a fusion partner called SUMO, nothing to do with SUMO wrestler. It's actually an abbreviation for small ubiquitin like modified object. Ubiquitin is a, have you heard of ubiquitin? Ubiquitin is a, N, is a protein. You know the word ubiquitous? It means something that, was, that is present everywhere. So ubiquitin was an enzyme as a protein that is present in every cell that we have encountered. So we just named it ubiquitin because it's present, because it is ubiquitously, uh, ubiquitously present. It's a weird word. So uh, SUMO is a kind of a fusion partner. It helps our AMP to, pro to express in a better condition and makes it soluble. 
because again, this A and B is a, it's a, it's a foreign DNA. It, the bacteria won't be happy with it, right? So we have to make it more compliable. So we use this fusion <coughs> partner to uh, to lure the bacteria to I mean uh, to assure them that yeah, it's a good protein producer. So we are just faking it for the bacteria. And this tiny sliver of a uh, tag we at attach is called six histidine tag. Histidine is a it's an amino acid. And histidine tag can be used for purifying, which I will show you later on. Uh, okay, so histidine tag helps in purifying the protein using nickel column. So because in a bacteria, when you take the protein out, there should be like a hundreds of protein along with the with our protein, right? Because the bacteria has their own protein. How would we figure out a way of just extracting our protein from the mixture? We use the his tag, the six histidine tag from it. And we use a cannabis resistant gene. So we are actually making the bacteria resistant to an antibiotic. Why? Because when you will grow this bacteria in a plate containing antibiotic, only these will grow and no other bacteria will grow because we don't want any contamination in our plates. So uh, what we do is after we put our plasmid in the bacterial cell, we'll just plate them in the agar plate containing antibiotic and only the transformed bacteria which has our gene will grow. All the other bacteria from air, from uh, water that might contaminate the plate will not grow. And so they grow and this is a real video from my lab. So we grow the bacteria, it's a super flow, it's a slow motion video. So we grow the bacteria in huge uh, jars and make them grow for a day and then we precipitate the bacteria using centrifugation, we take the cells out, we lyse the cell, we destroy the cell, we take all the protein out, but then again there's a huge slurry of proteins in there. We use the nickel column to purify our, our protein of interest because again I told you it has a his tag, the tag will attach to the nickel column and that's how we can separate our protein from all the other proteins in the bacteria. Yeah. So have you had? I mean, if you have done uh, uh, have you ever done HP HPLC or have you heard of HPLC, liquid chromatography? No one. Filtration using columns. Okay. So it might be a bit jarring for you uh, at this present. Okay. So have you done SDS? Have you heard of SDS page? What's the page? So we <laughs> okay. So we use a gel uh, a gel slab to make the bacteria, uh, make our proteins migrate and we can identify a protein by running it against a ladder of different uh, weights. So it might not mean much to you but these are our proteins that we can see in a gel slab. So this is proof that we, our protein was produced, okay. So this is practicing this is urosin. okay, this is enough, like we just pro produced a protein, is our work done? Never. So, but shouldn't like new act, new AMPs uh, that hasn't been used in the bacteria just solve everything? Mm, I don't think so. So what we do is, suppose you have three bacterial species in your body. Species A, which is pathogenic. B is non-pathogenic, but it's opportunistic. It might grow pathogenic. And C is commensal, which stays in your gut, doesn't harm you, helps you even. So if we use a broad spectrum antibiotic which kills all the bacteria, what will happen? It will kill the species A which is pathogenic but it also will kill species C which was in your gut in naturally. And then what happens? It might spare some colonies of species B and that will grow unchecked because there is no C to control their growth. So this is how species B being opportunistic may evolve to become pathogenic. So we need targeted elimination of bacteria, not just a blanket killing, a targeted elimination. So it's complicated, yeah, I mean evolution is complicated, we have to work around it somehow. But whatever we try to do is never going to be enough, there will be new bacteria resistant to it, or is it? We have to find out something that can kill, that can find bacteria that we want to kill and kill them specifically. Do you know anything in natural, uh, natural world that does it? Like kills and finds, files and kills bacteria specifically, anything in the natural world? Bacteriophage. Have you heard of bacteriophage? The virus that attacks bacteria and they can only attack very 
specific species of bacteria, not all of them. So yeah, it does a superhero landing like this, you know, it's completely true. So they are highly specific, they only attack a species of bacteria that they want to attack and they bind on the cell surface. And this binding happens because they have something uh, called coat protein which finds something on the bacterial cell surface and binds to it and it will not bind to any other cell or not bind to any other bacteria that it doesn't want to bind to. So we just borrowed its technique, what we do was we uh, browse literature, we found a, a phage that uh, specifically infects Staph aureus. So we took the coat protein sequence out of it, we attach it to the uh, our AMPs, we make a chimeric protein which is a new uh, protein and we express them and we tested our AMPs against both Staphylococcus and non Staphylococcus species. What happens after that is, so we used uh, these four species of bacteria, the Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis which are the Staph species and we use non staph species which is Enterococcus faecalis and Bacillus subtilis. This bacteria is important because it is a common uh, gut bacteria that helps in our digestion. So we don't want to kill them. So this is our, what our AMP will look like, it's a chain of amino acid, this is what AMP looks like and this is the targeting domain, the phage protein which might help them to figure out which is staph and which is not staph. So what we do is we just attach our uh, targeting domain with our AMP we make a new protein that is a chimeric protein which has a targeted, uh, which is targeting towards bacteria that we did it wants and how does it work? So suppose this is a cell membrane and suppose this is a membrane for a staph or staph bacteria. So this is our modif non-modified AMP, it will just go and bind with it and cause disruption of cell membrane, it will cause all the nutrients to leach out and the bacteria dies. So what happens if we use a targeted AMP? So targeted AMP has this uh, thing, the targeted domain. It will go and find this cell surface protein and then it will again do the same thing and disruption cell membrane. So it works on the staph bacteria regardless of having targeted or non-targeted uh, domain. But what happens if you use a non-staphylococcus non bacteria, so like Bacillus subtilis or Enterococcus? You see that the previous one had this uh, brown uh, cell surface protein, this one does not have that. So a non-modified AMP would go and kill it likewise the same way. But a modified protein which has this uh, A12C phage uh, protein will not go and find the binding domain, so it will not kill the bacteria. So whatever we may try, it will not bind to the surface and not kill the bacteria. So uh, have you heard of the term MIC, minimum inhibitor concentration? When we measure the effectivity of uh, antibiotics, we measure it using minimum inhibitory concentration. So like the minimum amount of drug required to just stop their growth. So lower the MIC, better the drug. Remember that, lower the MIC, better the rapid, that means you require less amount to kill the bacteria. So what do you see? So how many of you are statistics nerds? Statistics, okay. This is a box plot. So have you have any idea about box plot? What a box plot is? Have you had, uh, uh, you have idea about histograms? Any graph, bars? Okay, bars, you know bars. So. So these bars, so higher the bar, more the MIC, worse the killing potential, lower the bar, better the MIC. So now, pay attention, have some patience here. You have, on the right, we have the staph species, and urosin and plectocin, and you see in the urosin, the killing potential for both non-targeted and targeted are the same, almost the same. So it kills the bacteria either way. Same for uh, Staph aureus and Epidermidis, same for Plectocin and uh, both Staph aureus and Staph Epidermidis, it kills either, either way. But what happens if you use non-Staph species? You see there's a huge gap in the killing potential. So the non-targeted kills the bacteria, the targeted ones will spare non-Staph species. So we took a molecule that would kill either way 
and we made it non-lethal to some bacteria while being lethal to the others. So we kind of created a magic bullet that will only kill the species we want and not any other species. Same for uh, Enterococcus fecalis. So we saw that there's a huge gap in killing potential when we use non-specific bacteria. So inclusion, so both AMPs had a huge activity against all species of bacteria and when we use the targeting domain, they would not kill non-species bacteria and but with targeting domain, they had the same killing potential for both staph and non-staph species. So by attaching this phage protein, we kind of m transformed a lethal, a lethal molecule into a non-lethal one for the species we want to kill and not the ones we don't want to kill. So it's kind of the work done, right? Is it? We need more studies, a lot more studies. So every, every scientific article that you read would end with, we need more studies. Nothing is absolute in science, ever. We need to make it more pliable for therapeutic use because we have made this molecule in our lab. We can't just <coughs> inject people with that. We have to make it more uh, safer for and uh, follow FDA regulations and this and that. And we have to figure out a way to deliver them because it's a protein. It's hard to, so I mean, we can't just digest because what will happen if you digest protein? It will get broken down by the enzymes. So we have to inject it somehow and figure out a way to deliver our proteins. And we have to kill other bacteria as well, not just staff. We have to work with others. And maybe just get some ice cream. Everyone loves ice cream, right? And get my PhD at the end. Any questions? Yeah. What am I? I'm a PhD candidate. Any other question? Come on. Yeah. So you you say you kill like regular clinic or like daily, right? So do you have to like do your dissertation on that? Do you do like a project on that? Yeah. So this is what my project is, my main overarching project. So for a dissertation, we need to uh, make scientific articles, at least three of them. So I'm working on getting at least one now, and then I'll have to work with some other antibiotics and work with new species, get some new papers, and eventually get my PhD. <coughs> Any other question? Yeah. So have you been using the bacterial killing virus very much to, against the antibody resistance against bacteria? Yeah, so we're not using the virus the complete virus, we are using just their coat protein. So uh, there is something called a phage therapy. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah, so the phage therapy uses the phages itself. But what we did was we have AMPs that can kill bacteria. We just, we just need to make them more streamlined so that they only kill the bacteria we want and spare the others. So what we took was we took the, the tail protein, the coat protein from the phage that helps them to bind with the bacterial surface and it's attached to our protein. So it makes them uh, more targeted, okay? This is what we, we just borrow the technique. I mean, uh, in the former Soviet Union, they had a huge research going on for phage therapy, but it's uh, kind of discontinued right now. Nobody uses that anymore. Any question? No question at all. I've heard that you ask really tough questions. I haven't heard it. So I made this slide. I couldn't just use it anymore. Just ask more question, yeah.